So uh, let's get it started tonight. We gathered here together in one mind and one accord to praise the name of Jesus, the one that we adore, who's brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, praise the name of Jesus, eternal life he gives. I'm going to praise the Lord, praise his holy name, praise him for news and the joy that he brings come on and praise the lord while the ages roll glory hallelujah everybody praise the lord well let's thank him for his mercy and let's thank him for his grace let's thank him for redemption on the cross he took our place he's coming back from glory on the cloud to call his own oh praise the name of jesus i know it won't be long i'm gonna praise the lord praise his holy name praise him for the good news and the joy that he brings come on and praise the lord while the ages roll glory hallelujah everybody praise the lord Let's praise the Lord, praise His holy name, praise Him for the good news and the joy that He brings. Come on and praise the Lord, while the angels roll, glory, hallelujah, everybody praise the Lord, praise Him, praise Him, oh, let's praise Him in the morning, praise him in the noontime, praise Him, praise Him, glory, hallelujah, everybody praise the Lord, come on and praise the Lord, praise His holy name, praise Him for the good news and the joy that He brings, come on and praise the Lord, while the ancients roll, glory,
For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God fire and the darkest nights you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your
will sing of the goodness of Praise the Lord. How about the Jubilee Choir? Amen. What a great start to the 25th Jubilee. Everybody say praise the Lord. Everybody say amen. Think about a year ago, we didn't know if we would be here again, but God has blessed us with another year. The 25th Spring Jubilee. And I just have a feeling it's going to be the best one yet. Amen. Let's make welcome our dear friends, Mike Bland and Evidence, back to the Spring Jubilee. Amen. Praise Good evening. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. I am serving Christ, my Savior, the Holy One of Galilee. With joy I praise Him and tell the story of how he suffered for you and me. Oh, it thrills me, it thrills me, it thrills me, it thrills me. What this love of God's more precious than gold. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. He is always with me. Oh, yes, I can feel him in my soul. And consolation to know his friend is by my side. He'll guide my footsteps through realms of glory where I shall with him forever abide. Oh, it thrills me, it thrills me, it thrills me, it thrills me. What this love of God's more precious than gold. Yes, I can feel it in my soul. Oh, it thrills me, it thrills me, it thrills me. Yes, it thrills me. What does love of God's more precious than gold? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. He is always with me. Oh, yes, I can feel it in my soul. Oh, it thrills me, it thrills me, it thrills me. Yes, it thrills me. What does love of God's more precious than gold? always with me. Oh, yes, I can feel him in my soul. Oh, yes, I can feel him in my In the blood of the Lamb, I am saved and I know that I am. I'll never be the same again. By His grace, thank God I am washed in the blood of the Lamb. He bought me with a price He paid on Calvary. Same again by 
by His grace, thank God I am washed in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. In the blood. same again by his grace thank god i am washed in the blood of the lamb no oh, i'll never be the same again by his grace thank god i am washed in the blood washed in the blood washed in the blood of the lamb A journey to that city for square and by faith in the love of God I surely will enter there and on some right tomorrow with the saints I stand I'm gonna put on a crown and walk around all over God's promise land oh glory what a wonderful day I'll join the song of the blood was strong while the ages roll away and when I get to heaven on that beautiful strand, I'll put on a crown and walk around all over God's promised land. How many is looking forward to going? Thank you, Lord. Could be tonight. Well, there will be no dying, no more trouble and strife, and we're going to live through the ages by. A beautiful stream of life. And when I join that chorus in heaven's happy band, I want to put on a crown, walk around all over God's promised land. Well, oh, glory, what a wonderful day. I'll join the song of the blood was strong while the ages roll away. And when I get to heaven on that beautiful strand, stream of life and when i join that chorus and heaven's happy band i'm gonna put on a crown walk around all over god's promise land oh glory glory what, what a wonderful day i'll join the song of the blood was strong while the ages roll away and when i get to heaven on that beautiful strand well i'm gonna put on a crown
so good to me I've got to testify What the devil meant for evil God worked it for my good And I made it Oh, I made it Thank God I made it through What the devil meant for evil God worked it for my good And I made it Oh, I made it Can I tell you I made it
gave me a joy I can't explain. You're on holy ground. So I'm gonna keep on shouting in Jesus' name. You're on holy ground. I heard him say, Moses, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Lord, have mercy. Moses, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. God, there's still fire. Keep some burning. Down in my soul. so blessed let me tell you one of the reasons the fellow that was just up here waving those hankies he was the one that God laid it on his heart to get this started about 28 years ago we had a couple years that we couldn't have it 27 28 years ago this is the 25th year for the meeting and Bob's been here shouting every year and we appreciate what God has done Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> Praise God. Oh, glory to God. 36 years in the same church. I tell you, I was unsaved. I'm an alcoholic, a sinner, a thief, a robber. The blessed God, he laid his life down. <laughs> Bless his name. Glory, glory, glory. And such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and in his name. Hallelujah. We're not what we used to be. There's a change when Jesus comes into our heart. Glory to God. Well, bless his name. What a sweet place to be. And just think this is Monday night. But I remind you, I've been saying this for six months and I'm gonna say it one more time before I preach to you tonight. This, you should leave this service as though it is your last time of ever worshiping God on this earth. Every service you leave, you should leave ready to go to heaven. And by the way, don't hold back anything. God touched my heart on that. I'm telling you, I was in a revival. They were preaching me so hard. One night I'm sitting on the front and the singers are singing and God is stirring my heart and the, the longer they sang, the sweeter it got and I thought, oh, I better hold back. I, I better save my voice. And God said, well, if you go home to heaven tonight, you won't need your voice to preach tomorrow night. So just go ahead and give me all you got tonight. We may not get back here tomorrow night. So I want to worship his name tonight and know that he's brought us to this place for such a time as this. Oh, glory to God. You ought to be able to go to heaven from your last church service. That's what I'm saying. Don't be content with just the fact you're saved. Meet God knowing you're giving him your all. That's what means more than anything else. Well, praise God. I am so thankful for each one of you that have come. I'm going to the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah. I'll maybe just look, uh, maybe just at one or two verses here in the eighth chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter eight. You don't have to quit shouting. (laughs) Jeremiah chapter eight. Let me begin reading with verse four. I will read just a few verses to you leading up to the text verse. Jeremiah chapter four. Moreover thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord, shall they fall and not arise? Let me pause. If you're down, are you just gonna stay down? If you're discouraged, are you gonna stay that way? They have turned their back on God. He said, are you gonna continue on that path or are you gonna arise? And then he goes on to say, shall he turn away and not return? Are you really not gonna come back to me, the Lord says? Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to see, they refuse to return. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rusheth into the battle. Yea, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed time. And the turtle and the crane, which that's the turtle dove, and the bird, the crane, and the swallow observe the time of their coming. But my people know not the judgment. God says all of this is happening because I'm bringing judgment. Some people sin, go before them to the judgment, some after. But in this case, God was trying to stir his people to see them come to a place of a mighty revival. Now, I don't know if you take notes. If you do, 
you better write real quick because I don't plan to hold you long. I'm gonna say what God's given me to say and then I pray that folks will come and get saved and we can shout it out and if the Lord tarries, we'll come back tomorrow night and do it all over again. But I call your attention to two words in verse seven. The second and the third word, the stork. Yesterday morning I told the church that God has chosen his creation oftentimes to speak to us and teach us some of the greatest lessons that we'll ever learn in life. In fact, by the time you get to the book of Romans, you'll find out that God said among other things, people can look at nature itself and be brought to conviction by a realization that there is a God by just looking at creation itself. All of this just didn't happen to be. Some say, well, it's intelligent design. I go beyond that. It's God's design. God made it all, and what he created, he teaches us through it all. Now, the stork teaches us some valuable, some valuable lessons. First, I want to share some information with you about the stork. First, I think when we think of the stork, the first thing that we think of, the stork is always related to new beginnings, to the springtime, and to birth. That's why the stork became a symbol of birth. Do you remember years ago when we were much more modest than what we are today? And by the way, I hate that modesty has left. Not only the nation, but modesty has also left the pulpit. I hear preachers say things in the pulpit that I cringe to hear them say. I don't have to be blunt and use the old vulgar worldly terms for you to understand certain things. There's some things that are very plain. If you're an adult, there's some things you ought to understand automatically. But back years ago, when we weren't so scientific and felt like kindergartners needed to know all of the facts of life before they've ever had a chance to experience life, we treated things with innocency and modesty. And when little kids were this tall and mommy would expect a baby, they would ask, mommy, is, is my brother or sister in your tummy? Yes. Well, how's my brother or sister gonna get here? The stork. The stork is going to bring them. So the stork became symbolized with birth. And the truth of the matter is, if we are saved, we've had a born again experience. So he's speaking expressly here to save people. It is an emblem in ancient church history as well to the resurrection. That's why it is a bird of the springtime. So it's a picture of birth. It's a picture, a picture of new birth, a picture of springtime. It's a picture of resurrection. By the way, the stork also symbolizing saved people. You may not know this, but it is an emotional bird. Storks cry tears. They weep. When they have certain events that happen, it's not uncommon for them when they're hurt or when they're sad to cry tears. Now, you don't have to be emotional, but don't step on my toes if I am. I know you can be just as saved and never shout, but also, some of us, we like to enjoy the trip. And I used to, you know, I used to be so embarrassed of that. I remember my mother was an old time shouter. My sisters are here tonight and they'll verify this. My mother was an old time shouter and you never knew when she was going to shout and you knew one thing, it was gonna be loud. And you knew something else. Out of all of these people here, all of these hundreds of people, if my mother was in this building and shouted right now, and I couldn't see her for the crowd, I'll guarantee you I'd know her shout. She shouted like nobody else could shout. I believe when I, when I get to heaven, I'll know my mom's shout. The shout won't be because of hurting, and the shout won't be because of pain. It'll be because uh, she's gonna look to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. My mama was a shouter, my daddy was a shouter. You can tell when a shout was building up with my dad. 
he'd start flinging his arm around like this. Then he'd say, glory, glory, glory. And be careful, the next thing coming out was a shout. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to weep. It's okay to feel joy. They not only cry tears, but they're a symbol of longevity and immortality. Do you know that storks also teach us a lesson on how we're to treat our parents? Do you know storks, when their parents get older, they don't abandon their parents, but they feed their parents when they get older. When the parents get so that they can no longer even chew up their food, the storks will chew up food and spit it in the mouth of the parent to help them get the nutrients that they need. Now, folks, I'm going to make a statement here, and I know the shout will leave, but facts are facts. If the Lord tarries his coming very long, for those of us that are senior saints, you get ready for this. There's coming a time where that soon and very soon, they're going to look at older people and say, you're not worth the trouble. Amen. They want you to pay into the system your whole life. But when it comes time to draw it out, they just assume you die. That is on, isn't it? And pretty soon there'll be basic medications you can't get because the sooner they can get you to die, the happier they are. Well, you say they wouldn't do that to old people. They've done it to babies for years. Unborn babies in the womb. They thought nothing about taking their life. Why do you think they would change? Preach it, Cal. Preach it, Cal. I thank all 20 of you for the amens. But it's coming. They just as soon euthanize you, find a quick way to get out. It doesn't, this is not politics. Both political parties are coming to an agreement in this area that they think that when you get to the place where it's no longer affordable to keep you, listen, younger people, listen, I'm preaching this because I'm getting older and I might need a little help later on. But don't throw the older folks away. They have paid the way. They have paid the price. They have given us a wonderful legacy of worship and they are worthy of our honor. They are worthy of our gratitude and they are worthy of our care. I gotta move. They feed their parents when they're old because they show gratitude. It does us good to watch out for those that aren't able to do anymore and to help them. Just be a good neighbor. Be a good son. Be a good daughter. Be a good person. Today, I was down at the local hospital. When I came in, there was an elderly couple that was getting out of their car. And it took them quite a while to get out of their car. And I stood there for probably two or three minutes holding the door. And the elderly couple, when they passed by, they said, do we know you? And I said, no, I don't think we've ever met. And they said, you've sure given your time to open the door. Why would you do that? And I said, first, because you deserve it. And second of all, I hope somebody will open the door for me when I'm bent over with years. Dr. Geiler is here tonight. He can't go like he used to go. And so many over the years, our ministry has tried to help as they've gotten older. And several of the preachers have told me, I'm not able to go anymore. Mike Blanton, he's battled illness and he's not able to travel like he used to travel. And So many people, when that happens and you support them, they'll say, why would you do such a thing? I'm not able to go like I used to go. I said, man, I don't support you for what you're doing. Sometimes I support you for what you've done. (laughs) 
Well, I can tell that's not going over well, so let me move on. Here's a piece of information you'll appreciate. Do you know in the early church, for those of you that have ever traveled to the Holy Land, it's not uncommon that they, in almost every church that you go, from the Byzantine era of time forward, they were big in the Byzantine era of time with mosaics. And the mosaics oftentimes were just towels that were put in a setting like a portrait or a picture. And when you travel into a lot of the old Orthodox churches, it's not uncommon that you'll see these mosaics of the disciples of Christ. And oftentimes when you see the disciples of Christ, you will see in the background, for example, they may be by the, the Jordan River. And in the background, if you look around, somewhere you'll find a stork. They embedded storks in those early mosaics, the early carvings, and the early paintings, if you will. Now, there was a reason for that because the stork has a unique ability as a bird. All other birds, every species of birds, just about, just about every species of bird is terrified of a snake. They know that snakes, if, they, if they're too big to eat, they're concerned the snakes will get their eggs or get their little ones. They're all terrified of a snake. Some of them, like the eagle, they can, they can kill the snake, but still they have a concern. That's why they build their, their nest oftentimes if it's in a rocky region, in the cleft of the rock, so the serpent can't get to the young and to the eggs. Even though they're stronger than the snake, they still watch out for the snake. Every bird that God created has a fear of the snake. There's one bird that is not afraid of snakes. It is the stork. In fact, the storks hate snakes and serpents so much that the perfect day in the life of a, ser of a, of a stork is to find a snake or a serpent and they're not only not afraid of it, they'll pester the snake or they'll terrorize the snake. They're one of the only birds that the snake is afraid of instead of the bird being afraid of the snake, the snake is afraid of the stork because it won't let the snake alone. It just pesters it and pesters it and pesters it and terrorizes it. Do you know something? The devil's not afraid of anybody in this world except one group of people, and that's people that have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit of God. That group that Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're always on the defensive against the devil. Let me tell you something. Don't worry about the devil. He ought to be worried about you. Live your life so that when your feet hit the floor in the morning, the first thing the devil says, oh no, they're up. Here they come again. He's not in control. He doesn't have the final say. God's in control. I've come this week to see people take back some stuff that the devil stole from them and to see them terrorize the serpent. He came against you, but he picked the wrong one to come against because you've come to a place where you know through the power of God that your Father, Jesus Christ, your Savior, can do anything, and he's overcome the enemy, and because of him, we have power over the serpent. These are they that have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. But think too about this before I close. Think about the stork, because in this passage, it makes it clear, the stork in the heaven knoweth her appointed times. Two words, appointed times. Why is that in your Bible? Just to fill up space? No. It's in your Bible because God made the stork and God understands how the stork operates. Do you know that the stork is a migratory bird? 
there comes a time of year where they migrate back. In Israel every year now, the number, the last number I read is nearly half a million storks in the fall migrate to Africa and beyond every fall, half a million of them. And then in the spring, half a million of them come back. They return. Doesn't that sound like the passage that I read to you? Return, return. They come back at the appointed time, at the appointed place. Now here's the amazing thing. They've done a study on storks from the Middle East. And in Israel, the half a million storks that migrate every year, they always leave exactly the same day of the year. All of them, they leave at once. And in the spring, they come back on exactly the same day every spring. They know this because now they know when the storks are coming home, they have such a determination to make it home on that appointed time that they now oftentimes reroute air traffic because a half a million of these birds are coming in at the appointed time. Nothing's going to stop them. They're not afraid of a jetliner, an airplane. Nothing's going to stop them. They're going home and they're going through the heavens and they're going to make it home at just the right time on the appointed time and there's nothing in the air that's going to hinder them in any way. They're going to make it home at just the right time. What a determination. Now the amazing part about that is if you study it close, you'll find out that when they leave, some of these fly 2,000 miles over water. They can't land anywhere, nowhere to land. When they leave, they don't have a GPS. They can't say, Siri, how long will it take me to get home? They don't have any of that. They have inside of them a nature that God has given them. That they know they don't have a calendar, but they know when the time is right to leave and they know when the time is right to come home. Now when they leave, they've got to have a determination that nothing is going to stop them. They're going to make it home no matter what is between them and home. They don't know what the wind current will be. They don't know if there'll be storms that they have to go around or fly above. It doesn't matter if there's a desert below them. It doesn't matter if they fly over mountains and they fly over valleys. They're going to make it home at just the right time. You may not know the appointed time, but can I assure you this? God has numbered your days and my days. And when it comes time to go home, I don't know what I'll face between here and there, but I know I want to make it home safe, and I know I want to make it home at the perfect time. Not before, not later. It's in his hands and at his time. The number one battle that sick people face that I visit when they've been sick for a long time, the number one question they'll ask me, preacher, why is God leaving me here? How long? Sometimes families will say, why are they holding on? And we say it respectfully, and I know that it's true to some point. And they'll say, we're, we're waiting on certain people to come for them to see. And I know all of that, all of that is truth, but that's not the ultimate reason. We can't go home until he appoints the time.
There's people right here in this building. Can I just ask you, if you're not embarrassed, to raise your hand. How many of you in this building have had a near-death experience or near-death illness? Would you raise your hands? All of it, look at that. Wow, look at that. Hey, by the way, keep them up there. Every one of you are a miracle. Every one of you are a miracle. And I know there's a multitude, some accidents, some with cancer, other diseases. God spared your life. Got a miracle just today, one of our folks. I believe Connie's here tonight in the service. Her son, he, he, he was just saved last week when Jamie went up to visit with him. He was just saved and they gave them no hope whatsoever. They couldn't get him off the ventilator. He was setting up eating potatoes. And it's a miracle. It's Donnie's brother. You've got a right to be happy. They talked to me about his funeral. Why, uh, why didn't he go home, Connie? Donnie, why didn't he go home? All of you that raised your hand, why didn't you go home? Not the appointed time. Listen now, I'm closing. I don't care how much knowledge we have, how much influence we have, how much power we have. This is the plain truth. God is always in control. That's never changed. That will never change. So until we get to go home, you know why Jesus came to this world? I know he came to save the lost, to give his life to shed his blood. But the Bible also said that he came that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Jesus came to give the devil the devil. That's why he came. And by the way, he says, now you're my disciples, give the devil the devil. Let him know that you're not subject unto him, that he doesn't have the final say, that that's not the end of all of it. Don't you listen to him when he tells you your church cannot grow and souls cannot be saved and that you are finished and that you can do nothing else. Give the devil the devil. Say, hey, listen, I'm here and I'm gonna do what God wants me to do until God is finished with me. You're not home. That means that you have a purpose. And for you that are lost, thank God the appointed time hasn't come yet. Because you've got one more opportunity. Get ready to sing whatever y'all have. Uh, a few years ago, God changed my mind about giving invitations. I look at it different. I don't say this very often, but I'm going to say it to you tonight. Let me tell you what an invitation really is, an invitation of the Holy Spirit to people that don't know the Lord. The invitation is really Jesus proposing to you. That's what it is. He wants you to be a part of his bride. Man, isn't it great when you see those videos of how all the, I tell you, these, these young people, they're so smart. I mean, that they're so smart. They come up with these, these ways of now proposing. It's unbelievable some of the things they go to, through and the things they do to propose. And isn't it great to see somebody say yes? But doesn't it make you shudder when someone proposes with a heart of love and the person says, no, I reject your proposal. Your heads are bowed. She plays softly before Greg leads us in song. 
If you're here tonight and the devil has told you there's nothing you can do for God, 